Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk, the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am joined by Lisa Fathers. Lisa is the Director of Teaching and School and Partnerships at the Bright Futures Educational Trust. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, how are you Ross? I'm very well. Uh, it's lovely to connect with you at long last after all these years. Um, could you tell listeners a little bit more about uh, who you are and what you do? I can. So yeah, I'm Lisa, I'm based in the Northwest. Uh, I'm part of the executive team on our multi-academy trust, Bright Futures, but I also lead the teaching school, which is called the Alliance for Learning. Uh, quite a big teaching school uh, spanning the whole of the Northwest, really. We work with over 400 schools. We have a maths hub, a skit, uh, trained teachers in early years, primary and secondary. Uh, and we have a huge school to school and CPD offer as well. Um, so I've got kind of a dual role leading that, but also contributing to the exec level stuff on our trust as well absolutely love it so, uh, in addition to so that i'm a you're, mom you're busy you be, being busy is an understatement is what you're trying it to is <laughs> it is but but busy is good right um so what i'll always like to do is just give a little kind of historical context could you describe your 16 year old self to listeners what were you like at school um so i was described by my teachers as bubbly um which my parents translated as talking too much in class Cheeky. um i was quite <laughs> o quite overweight um, I was, um, I had a, a, you know, a large group of friends, but I was moody. Um, my parents would say that I was very moody, um, but I wasn't really, really naughty. I kind of knew which side was the, the you know, the, the right side of, of behavior uh, and only pushed it a little bit. I hope that my daughter um, is better behaved than I was. And how, how did you get on with your exams? How did you get through that phase of your life? GCSE is all right. I knuckled down in the end. I had some really good teachers um, and, you know, I was under quite a lot of pressure from my dad because my dad is a retired head teacher. Uh, and at the time he was still, I think he was deputy head around that time. So I almost rebelled against him a little bit because he, he put so much pressure on me to, to revise and work. And he was a math teacher. So it was all yeah. about maths. So that's <laughs> oh, why cool. I went down the English route, actually, and, in, uh, in rebellion. At what point in your life did the conversation about being a teacher happen? So I went to university and studied uh, English and communication studies. And I think it was in my third year, really. I, I'd always liked, um, well, loved my subject and I'd always liked young people and children. But I was on an hour about whether to be a, a social worker or a teacher. Um, and I, I come from a, a long line of teachers. My aunt, two of my aunties are teachers. My dad was a teacher. Um, and I ended up just looking at the length of courses and to be a social worker, it was two years and to be a teacher, it was one. So that's what was what swung it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I, I, so to, to tell, tell, tell me a little bit more about your teaching career, your, your journey and you know, the kind of opportunity, the roles that you've had in the schools and those types of things. Yeah. So I did my PGC at Manchester University, English with Drama. A big shout out to John Keane, who I believe is still there. Um, and it was a real privilege actually recently to, to be asked to go back and share my leadership journey with, with some trainees. And then I did my first 10 years at a big mixed comprehensive in Warrington, um, on the other side of Warrington, Great Sankey, uh, where I taught English and drama. I had lots of uh, different responsibilities there. I was really lucky. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I had a pastoral role, I had a department role. Uh, I even had a secondment short one at the local authority around PSHE. Um, I think my favourite role when I was there was um, being the community outreach director and, and primary liaison and all that kind of stuff because um, mm. we were a specialist engineering college. Absolutely loved that. Uh, and then I started looking for um, senior leadership jobs. And at that school, um, there were an awful lot of really good middle leaders. So um, I knew that I'd have to look outside. So I then went on um, maternity leave um, with my daughter. And when I was on maternity leave, I secured my first uh, SLT post, which was in a, um, a school in Trafford uh, as assistant head. Okay. And I was director of specialism and it was a sports college, which was interesting because I'm not a PE teacher. So it was all for me, it was all about how we use the messages of sport and well-being across the school. Uh, and then I progressed to being deputy head, uh, associate head teacher. Uh, and then I was looking for a headship. Um, I did a bit of interim headship stuff. Um, and then I saw this role, um, which was at the time head of teaching school slash um, co-principal at Bright Futures. Um, and I took that job, absolutely loved it. And um, the teaching school has now grown. And, and obviously now I've got a slightly yeah. different title 
um, which is direct to level. So prior to COVID, could you just give us a sense of the things that you would be doing at, at that strategic level, you know, for your for the being the director of the kind of ITT uh, school? Yes, yeah, so I would be going to meetings with lots of partners and um, doing some CPD delivery, perhaps leading a, a team of special of um, system leaders and going into schools and doing reviews, uh, coaching head teachers, um, overseeing a number of um, kind of regional projects. Um, and in a way, you, you said what we were doing before COVID, I'm still doing all of that, but I've obviously had to learn how to yeah. do it very differently. So um, on that note, how, how's lockdown been for you personally before you talk about your work challenges? Personally, oh gosh, um, honestly, I found it really tough. Both my children were at home. My husband was like a caged animal. He's used to being at work all the time. Um, he decided to uh, take up cycling and bought an awful lot of Lycra in quite a short space of time. <laughs> I've done um, the same. <laughs> yeah, so he was out a lot on his bike um, and I was left to do homeschool and a full-time job. Um, you know, it, it wasn't all bad. There were some nice bits as well that, you know, yeah. there was that period of time when the weather was really nice and we had some nice family time. But I found it quite a challenge, particularly with my eight year old son who just wanted to go on his Xbox. And yeah. it was just like, you know, in the that. end, we, we managed about two hours schooling with him a day. Um, and it reminded me, you know, how much respect I have for those early years and primary teachers out there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, we went through that whole bell curve. I got the like out, uh, a try. Uh, I, I did virtually nothing. My wife did the vast majority while I tried oh. to keep the work coming in and thankfully switched to online. But, um, you know, the, the ex initial excitement about homeschooling soon dissipated into may maybe a couple of hours a day and then towards the summer term became a real struggle. And we're qualified teachers and we're- Exactly. So you do think the vulnerable children, parents out there, um, what a tough gig it would have been. And, you know, uh, uh, your thoughts on the narrative about delivering remote education and laptops and all those types of things? I think that schools have to have a plan. Um, well, they legally do now, don't they? But I, I think that having that backup plan it is really useful. Um, I think that we've all learned a lot in, in the last six months. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Oak National Academy is a, a really useful resource as a, a kind of thing to go alongside what individual schools are doing. Um, I think that the schools that are doing it really well are those that, are, that have got a, a sensible approach in terms of workload as well, because you know what I've seen at the moment is teachers managing the, the children they've got in front of them at the same time as having to do cater for the children that are at home as well. So I think, you know, Everybody can't do everything. Well, what were your uh, what was your trust's initial pressures at the beginning, and how did it adapt from you know March towards July? Uh, how was the well, your story? I think at first there were some teachers that adapted really easily because there are you know like like in, in every um, profession there are some people that are, are easier at adapting than others to change. Obviously, and um, there are some teachers that have got an awful lot of digital expertise and they could very quickly. Um, think innovatively about how to change things up whereas perhaps um, you know I'm not in the classroom anymore but if I was you know I'm in my 40s and it, it took me a while to get to grips with some of the technology that I've had to use to for CPD so I think it's peaks and troughs really and mm -hmm. um, I think some of the challenges for us uh, in some of our schools was around um, the, the disadvantage and, and the children that, that didn't have access to laptops iPads even Wi-Fi, um, and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we won't talk about it. I'm sure today because there's too too much other stuff to talk about on on the list. But you know, when we think about some of the children that actually are thinking about where they're getting the next food from, um, it, it's it's no surprise that having um you know access to remote learning wasn't the top of the priority yeah. list. Um, so no, we've had to work with that and, and be creative, and we had a lot no, of teachers. I, sorry, I'm interrupting you. It's um it's half term for you today, isn't it? Um, no, next week. Oh, you've got another week to go. So um, what, what's the mood today with your with the body of your staff, teaching staff? So we break up today uh, in most of our schools. Honestly, people are absolutely exhausted, um, like never before. I mean, people are always tired at this time of year, and, and we normally limp, don't we, that last week towards half term, but mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. And I think that, that head teachers are really tired as well because really... A, a lot of senior teams, all they've been doing is managing track and trace internally in school. Yeah. Um, and that pressure of knowing that there's all that other stuff that, that people are not getting to. And I think 
the reactive nature of how things are at the moment it's just so tiring yeah um you, uh, the best analogy i heard was a, a bit like being on the ghost train one you know you're going to be it's going to happen you, uh, you're committed to the ride but um it seems in this case that it's a long ride that we're in for and uh, we don't know when it's going to happen and that that challenge of managing kids at home as well as on uh, physically has become uh, 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 just a daily burden. I, I know when I was doing cover as a deputy, it was probably one of the hardest jobs to do, you know, strategically as well as day-to-day -day management, because often the next day something would happen and all your strategy would go out the window. So I can only imagine now with COVID, yeah. it would be just a never-ending chore. Um, I want to talk about workload and well-being. Um, you, you, you do a lot of work, so uh, I want to talk about uh, your, the Greater Manchester Mentally Healthy uh, School programme that you do. Can you tell listeners more about that? Yeah, so this is really exciting, um, a huge project across Greater Manchester. So it was called the Greater Manchester Mentally Healthy Schools and Colleges programme, and it was funded by health. Uh, so we had, I um, can't remember the exact figure now, but quite a lot of money to roll out um, an innovative kind of preventative program. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we got uh, my teaching school, uh, the Youth Spot Trust, uh, 42nd Street, place to be, uh, and obviously our health colleagues around the table and said, right, what can we do? Um, and to cut a very long story short, what we did was we provided 135 schools with a kind of package. So uh, four members of staff got mental health first aid training. Um, the Youth Spot Trust did, did a lot of stuff with students in terms of leadership of mental health and leadership of well-being. Um, Place to be did kind of senior staff training um, to help schools have a strategic plan for mental health and well-being. And 42nd Street. Uh, provided some one-to-one -one counselling support for those students that, that needed the most support um, and actually the impact has been huge um, it, it's made a real difference in terms of culture and, uh, and ethos mm -hmm. um, but also what we're seeing now is that some of those students that were trained have gone on to continue to be real ambassadors of mental health um, and, and actually you know we didn't know the pandemic was coming at the time we did this but it, it really helped set the schools up to have a, a bit more of an infrastructure around those things and a bit more expertise. Um, I mean I won't bore you with the stats and stuff but I'll just tell you very briefly um, a story about one of the, the thing that one of the real highlights for me was there was a little boy from a primary school in Bolton and he'd not taken his hoodie off for a couple of years Right. And when he came to one of these mental health conferences that we ran, he wanted to put on the special uh, GM Mentally Healthy Schools T-shirt. Um, and his teacher said, oh, no, that, you know, he's just not going to take his hoodie off. And because he really wanted to be a champion of mental health, because he knew how much he found it a challenge, he took his hoodie off. The, the staff oh. couldn't believe it. And that was the beginning of him growing as a person, really. Amazing. So. And what impacts um, this project had on your staff, you know, for workload, their workload and well-being? Yeah, so it's hard to say because in terms of um, collecting the data of long term impact, etc, that's that work still being done. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, um, people felt that the mental health first aid helped them focus on their own mental health better, because part of that course really is helping you think about yourself and how well you are mm -hmm. and how much stress you've got in your own bucket and what your own coping strategies are to allow you to help other people. And I had a, a number of emails from teachers during that training period saying, you know, I know this sounds really dramatic, but that, that training course saved my life. You know, it can, couldn't have come at a better point. It made me stop. It made me reassess. You know, I stopped doing some things that I didn't need to do anymore. Um, you know, I started doing a bit more exercise. Right, so, on. yeah, it was really nice. So um, on that note, you know, uh, I know you get a lot of satisfaction out of leading ITT. And uh, I've been thinking about emails uh, this morning, that nonstop burden of re re deleting and replying to emails. Um, what would be your kind of workload top tips just before we talk about your ITT work uh, in terms of teachers managing their mental health over the half term and trying to slowly switch off and recharge? Uh, you've been in the game long enough. What would be your recommendations? Well, I think it's a difficult question. What I would say is that some of the top tips come from the way that school leadership is. So for leaders, it's about having a really sensible um you know, approach to, to workload and marking strategies and and also it's about role modeling expectations. So, um, you know, a lot of our head teachers will role model leaving school on time on a Friday be mm -hmm. because that, you know, by by itself as an action gives permission for everybody else to do the same. It's about not sending emails really late at night 
um, and expecting a reply. Um, it's it's about the culture. It's about the culture of the place. And I think if you've got the right culture that allows people to say, I'm struggling right now. Um, I can't cope with this. I need a bit of help. I'm not going to be able to get that marking back in. Or actually, you've asked me to do something and I can't meet that deadline. Then I think everything else falls into place. Mm -hmm. In terms of an individual um, for, for kind of, uh, you know, main scale teachers or, or, or new entrants to the profession, I think it's about having a really sensible approach to the working day and you can only do what you can do within a certain time and you know you shouldn't be working till god knows what time at night you know you you, you have a working day and you try and do you know what you can in that time to the best of your ability i do think time management is important and you mentioned emails we can get sucked into being ineffective at doing other jobs if we've got our email screens open at the same time and, and sometimes i have to just shut that down and i have a dedicated time of day where i'll clear emails off mm -hmm. um I, I also think that social media pulls people in isn't it so putting your phone in a different room while you do a specific task for an yeah. hour you probably get a lot more done if you've not got your phone with you and some of this is the same advice that i'd give to teenagers as well yeah. you know it, it, it's common sense isn't it but it i think there are some kind of strategies that, you, that you'll know of yourself in, in terms of reducing marking and things like that. So whole class feedback, um, you know, not marking every piece of work, really thinking about the things that, that you can pick up and talk to people about rather than sitting there with a pen. Um, does that help? Yeah, no, it does. It's uh, uh, loads of strategies. So in terms of your IT work, um, we just before we come online, you said that you're very satisfied with that work. So tell us, uh, give us a little kind of overview of the things that you're doing, the projects you're working on, how you've also supported all your trainees or your, you know, your, your kind yeah. of groups of people through COVID particularly. Okay, so kind of under the umbrella of the teaching school, there's an awful lot of different things going on. So you mentioned projects then. So just to give you a little bit of an insight into some of the projects before we talk about the ITC uh, and the yeah. work of the skit. So we are currently uh, a DFE uh, RSHE Train the Trainer Hub. So we're currently giving training to 400 schools around the new RSHE curriculum and work with, with heads of PSHE. Finding that really, really rewarding because um, what it does is it brings people together mm -hmm. and it allows everybody to say, you know, we, we don't have all the answers, but what we are going to do is work together and work through this collaboratively. And I think that those partnerships and networks are really important. Um, in terms of our ICC work, so we've got a skit um, and the reason that we train early years primary and secondary is because we believe that there ought to be um, a really strong pipeline of new entrants to the profession in all those phases. Um, the reason that we, we started early years, which was our most recent one, is because, uh, you know, as a parent, that is the most important part. Um, getting it right early on, you know, catching the children early. And you can only do that if you've got really highly skilled practitioners in that area. Mm -hmm. And for me, having, you know, high quality teacher training for early years practitioners is, is crucial. Um, and then we've got primary and secondary, uh, and we have some niche routes into teaching as well. So we do the researchers in school. Uh, we're currently just looking at the teaching apprenticeship routes. Um, we, we've got a brilliant skit team. And in terms of, you know, job satisfaction, you know, it is the best profession in the world. I'm still really passionate about being a teacher and being in education. Um, you get the chance to make a difference every single day. And so many people go to work and can't say that. Um, so for me, it's really, yeah. really rewarding when I've got, you know, a, a load of new trainees and I know that they're really excited about their careers. And then, you know, they do a year with us. And what's really nice about our program is that they're actually in school from the beginning. Um, uh, and that that brings a lot of strength because we've got um, some amazing tell me some of the projects that you're you're working on you know what before or during covid i'm, I'm sure but uh, just give well, us an overview of some of the key things you're doing oh god i've got a massive long list so we are a, a girls football super hub right um so yeah we've been designated by the fa so that's about innovation and partnerships and uh, really improving access to not just increasing participation of girls football but also thinking about the different careers in sports so we're using our PE sports hub to, to try and, and galvanize interest and, and and partnerships from schools in that um what else we're supporting probably uh, about 30 schools at the moment with different um school to school support packages mm -hmm. um and i have oversight of those at a strategic level um how has that changed during covid particularly 
so during COVID, um, so we, we still continue to support schools. And, and what we found was that some of the work that, for example, might be around helping schools improve curriculum or, or subject knowledge in an area, um, or, or perhaps change a strategy or a policy, we were able to do some of that remotely. Um, right. In terms of, of training as well, we, we managed to move 90% of our training online. And I must admit, I started off lockdown saying, nothing beats face-to-face -face CPD, absolutely nothing. There's no way that we can do X, Y, and Z online. You know, it just won't work. You can't build relationships. And to a certain extent, I do think nothing beats face-to-face -face CPD. But I have to admit, I have been pleasantly surprised by how, how much you can do online, actually. Um, and, and also using some of the functions on some of these platforms enables that dialogue that I didn't think existed at the beginning to happen. So, yeah, no, um, I mean, I've been doing webinars for 10 years, but obviously through COVID myself, everything's online. And uh, even new clients or new schools and, you know, by, you know, week five or week 10, you know, when you're checking in with people every week, you start to, you know, digital friends. Uh, and it's, it's very <laughs> interesting what you can achieve uh, through a computer link. Um we're kind of getting to our 20 minute barrier and this is where I start to throw in loads of interesting and quick fire questions, Lisa, to you. And my, my aim is to catch you off guard. Oh, uh, God. But um, what I, I'm sure you're familiar with Timmy Mallet. I like to kind of uh, just get people to respond really quickly and have a little bit of fun. Uh, but also there's lots of important things we've discussed uh, and, and some very serious um, and important topics such as teacher well-being and teacher workload. Um, so if you're happy for me to kind of plow on with some of them, um let, let's get started so um my first random question is if i went to i haven't been to warrington for um god maybe 15 years or so um where would we go if i came you know obviously covid aside but uh where would we go out to, to look around the town look at some historical insights if we had uh, 24 hours together okay well first of all i'd take you to the spin class that i teach <laughs> um that's at the local gym so you might want to get your lifer out uh, <laughs> Then we might go into Warrington Town Centre and go to the museum. Um, I might take you down the, the main street where the Golden Gates are. Then we might go and do a bit of shopping and then we'd head back to Stockton Heath where there's loads of lovely restaurants and we'd be able to sit, not socially distance and, and have a bottle of wine. How's okay, that? Fantastic. Um, if you did it all again, would you teach, train to teach PE or train to teach English and drama? Still trained to teach English and drama. I, I was absolutely hopeless at PE and um, any of my PE colleagues would howl at that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what books are you reading at the moment? Uh, so I'm currently reading a book called Bounce uh, about yeah. talent development. Um, my husband's a performance tennis coach and he read it and, and put it Matthew's next to the Yeah, I've met Matthew. It's yeah. fantastic book. You'll enjoy it. Um, what's on your desk today? What's your project to finish for half term? Oh, God, you don't want to know. So I don't know if you know much about the changes to teaching schools, but uh, there's some national changes uh, coming and teaching schools um, are ending next year and teaching mm. school hubs um, mm. are being rolled out. So I'm in the process of, of writing uh, bid applications. Another bid, yeah. I've done many bids in my career. And um, what would be your top tips for people wanting to go on a secondment or schools looking to develop the range of flexible working for staff? Uh, first of all, I'd say that spending time in another school is the best CPD that you can ever have. So uh, whether that's short term to common or long term to comments, I think that you get so much back. Uh, you see your own school through fresh eyes when you go back to your own school. Um, and even in the most challenging schools that you might end up supporting, there are always absolute golden nuggets of good practice um, in, in every school. So I would be fully up for that. In terms of flexible working, I think we've learned a lot about that through COVID actually. Um, you know, I, you know, my, my team are all working remotely at home. Uh, they're working really, really hard. Um, there's, you know, some flexible things there that, that you wouldn't have thought. So, you know, I could take my dog for a walk at lunchtime and come back and carry on. Um, and I also think that flexible working is something that we ought to think about as a a good employer for, for our staff yeah, that are parents, sure. um, particularly women. Um, what advice would you give your 16 year old self? Be less moody and realise what great parents you had. <laughs> OK, um, thoughts on the early career framework? I think it's a brilliant framework. Um, I think that, that that idea of supporting our early career teachers for, for five years instead of one or two um, is really important if you think about the numbers of, of you know teachers leaving the profession 
Uh, we really like it. We think it's very helpful. Um, homeschooling, um, lessons learned. What what advice would you give for everyone else? You know, the, the, the possibilities of lockdown and isolation still taking place. To be kinder on ourselves in terms of that perfectionism. Yeah, absolutely. To be kinder to yourself. To um, you, you can't replace a teacher. So just keeping some learning ticking over um, is, is, is good enough. Um, and actually having some time on your own during lockdown, I think, you know, for your own sanity is really mm -hmm. important. Um, what's your biggest career achievement you're most proud of? Oh, wow. Um, probably the growth of the teaching school, because I think it's, you know, partnerships, um, and networks and collaboration, I, I, you know, I, I think that they're the things that improve schools because, you know, you can't do it on your own and it's about building it together. And I think probably one of my biggest achievements is that I've brought schools together, I've brought people together in a sustainable mm -hmm. way. Fantastic. Um, now, I, I know you're already doing your dream job, but if you had that off the wall job that you could have done, what would it have been? If I'd had a decent singing voice, I would have loved to be um, a Spice Girl, uh, but I don't. Um, I, I always thought that I might be an actress. Recently, I've considered a, you know, changing career and going into politics because I think that, that there are some people that I could do a, a better <laughs> job than them. Um, Fantastic. You know. um, cognitive science and research and all, all this wonderful explosion uh, across the profession. Your thoughts? I think that, you know, being able to to do stuff that you know has an evidence base and that somebody else has already done some research around it and so that you know the impact it's going to have and the parameters it is really really important and I think it, it gives you power and mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of teachers as researchers as an ongoing thing you know being mm -hmm. curious mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that we're trying to embed, embed in our training and, teachers. And, and what's your number one tip for new teachers to the profession uh, getting immersed with research? join the Chartered College of Teaching. Okay, now you're Warrington Lass, where does your uh, kind of football loyalties lie in that part of the world? Oh gosh, so my daughter supports Manchester United, my son supports Nottingham Forest because that's where my husband's from. I've always quite liked Manchester United, but don't <laughs> tell anybody. <laughs> okay, let's not tell anyone. Okay, um, who do you recommend I interview next and why? So I would recommend that you interview either um, John Stevens, who's my CEO, Mm -hmm. because he is amazing um but in an understated way um or um cal hodgson who is the principal at cedar Mount academy uh, in okay. gorton um he's a new head and he's doing an amazing job all right well, you're gonna have to put me in touch with both of them and we'll, we'll see what we can do um where can listeners find out more about your your work your professional work as well as maybe personal like twitter channels things like that lisa yeah so um the teaching school website is allianceforlearning.co.uk uh, I am on Twitter at Lisa Fathers AFL uh, and the teaching school is tagged into that. So yeah, you can find me on there. And my final question, um, what would you hope to be your legacy? Gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I hope that schools continue to work together uh, in a collaborative way um, and that, that actually that there's more priority given to uh, teach teach training. Um, you know, I've been very disappointed this last week to see that the bursaries for next year in terms of ITC have been reduced. Yes. So, you know, I hope that that you know part of my legacy is that there's a, a, a continued uh, influx of teachers to the profession in Greater Manchester. Lisa, thank you very much. I'm definitely going to be checking out more about this, you know, your Greater Manchester Mentally Health programme. It sounds uh, fascinating and highly complex and of great value to our young people. Um, it's almost half term. Um, I wish you all the best um, and get lots of rest and all the amazing work that you're doing in your trust. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Thank you for your time. And thank you for all the amazing work that you do to nurture the next generation of teachers. And I, I, we, I hope to catch up with you physically. That would be lovely. Thanks very much, Ross. Thank you, Lisa.